Hi, this is ianx 4 Thanks for joining me today for a special episode, because today we're going to build a stacking raid farm. Stacking raid farms are a high-performance class of raid farms that use special mechanics to have several raids ongoing simultaneously. Since every raid can generate as many as 100 mobs, having several of them at the same time lets you generate a ton of drops. This stacking raid farm design can give you up to 128,000 total drops per hour, which includes 56,000 emeralds and 43,000 witch drops. That's about 5,300 redstone per hour and 5,300 gunpowder per hour. All this from a farm that's made from easily attainable materials and can be built quickly. Since most of the farm is actually cast from lava, you could very well spend more time transporting and placing the villagers in this farm than you spend building the actual structure itself, which can take as little as 30 minutes, if you know what you're doing. This stacking raid farm is designed to be safe and flexible, and tolerant of lag. You can operate the farm using manual clicking, for example, but an auto-clicker would be a lot more convenient. The auto-clicker can be server-side or client-side, from a separate auto-clicking program, or even a macro. The farm starts up quickly. It's pretty much at full speed in just a few minutes. And if you use a client-side auto-clicker, the farm will actually slow itself down when there's too much lag, which helps manage the lag so that it doesn't get out of hand on your server. And it's relatively safe from vexes as well. This bot here isn't even wearing armor, and has been running the farm for hours just fine. There are a lot of detailed mechanics involved with stacking raid farms, and I'll cover some of the main concepts in this video. Check out the video description for updated links to additional resources on stacking raid farms, as there are additional videos being planned by myself and others at this time. When you have the bad omen effect, and enter the 3x3x3 subchunk area around a village point of interest, such as a claimed job site or claimed bed, the game starts a special in-game event in the vicinity, called a raid, which spawns several waves of opponents for you to defeat. The raid is not a global event. It affects an area surrounding a specific location called the Raid Center. When the raid first starts, the Raid Center is determined by the average X, Y, and Z coordinates of any village point of interest within a 64 block radius of the player. So if there's only one point of interest close enough to the player, this is where the Raid Center is located. Once the raid starts, any player within 96 blocks radius of the Raid Center is considered to be participating in the raid. This is important, because you can't start a new raid when you're already in a raid. But it is possible to move the raid center by manipulating villager points of interest so that the raid center is moved away from its original location. And once the raid center is shifted more than 96 blocks away from its original location, a new raid can be started at the original location, even though there's already another raid happening at the same time, more than 96 blocks away. In this fashion, it's possible to have several raids ongoing simultaneously. A raid center must have a village point of interest in the 3x3x3 subchunk space around it in order for the raid to be sustained. The shifting of a raid center is based off of the game mechanic, where if at any time the game can no longer find a point of interest around the raid center, it will search the 5x5x5 subchunk space around the raid center for a subchunk that does have a point of interest within the 3x3x3 subchunk space around it. If one is found, the game then moves the raid center to the middle of that subchunk, at the X, Y, and Z subchunk position of 888. In practice, this means that the new raid center is one subchunk away from the newly found point of interest, with priority given to points of interest in the more negative X, Y, and Z directions, due to the order in which subchunks are searched by the game. It's simple to manipulate what counts as a village point of interest by using pistons to move job site blocks next to a villager. A common choice is the composter. It's cheap to craft, easy to confirm when they're claimed by a villager, since the villager takes on a big bright yellow hat, and composters can be moved with pistons and sticky pistons. When a composter is pushed or pulled into a new location, it breaks the association with any villager claiming it as a job site, so it no longer counts as a point of interest. This is temporary. The villager can quickly rediscover the job site or another job site next to it, but the brief time in which the village point of interest is lost will trigger a shift in the raid center. This farm design uses a tower with a series of villager stations. The composters in these stations are moved by sticky pistons in quick succession, starting at the bottom so that the raid center is shifted upwards to the subchunk just below the top of the tower. This shifts the raid center more than 96 blocks away from its original location, which allows for a new raid to start at the original location when the villager reclaims a job site. The mobs from a raid come in a series of waves. The game checks every 20 game ticks whether there are any illagers or witches within 112 block radius from the raid center, 
and any that are found are considered to be part of the raid. But if a game doesn't find any of those mobs, it makes up to 20 attempts to spawn the next wave of opponents, roughly 64 blocks radius, horizontally away from the X and Z coordinates of the raid center. Since the farm is built in the ocean, those attempts will all fail. It then tries another 20 times, this time at about 32 blocks of horizontal distance, and all those attempts will also fail for the same reason. Finally, it attempts to spawn the raid mobs right at the raid center, with a random 0 to 4 added to the X and Z coordinates of the raid center. This means that the possible spawning locations fall within a 5x5 five five square, with the raid center's X and Z coordinates at one corner and the opposite corner in the positive X and Z directions. If the highest block that is randomly selected is not a valid spawning space, like glass, the game will try again, making up to 20 attempts to find a valid spawning location. Once it finds one, all the mobs in the wave will be summoned to that location, with one air block underneath their feet. In this farm, the only valid spawning locations are these six spaces. Since there are 20 attempts to spawn in the 5x5 five five square, the odds are actually quite good that one of these six spaces will be selected, about a 99.6% chance. Most raid mobs that are summoned simply fall one block onto the spawn surface. Ravagers, however, are big enough to clip into the walls, and this allows them to contact the waterlogged stair block, which causes them to swim upwards so that they rise away from the other mobs. They also clip into the lava-filled cauldron, causing them to burn to death, and finally the ravagers clip into the composters, which have a hidden hitbox inside them that make them behave like vertical slabs, making them perfect for holding ravagers in place. The shifting floor beneath the mobs uses soul sand, which has a hitbox just a bit shorter than the normal solid block. This causes mobs to clip into the floor when it's shifted, where they take a bit of suffocation damage before falling down a chute onto another shifting floor. They impact the floor and take fall damage right as it shifts, and they drop through so that the player can finish them off with a sweeping edge attack on an armor stand below. The magma blocks on the shifting floor will kill off any stragglers that resist falling through the shifting floor, so that mobs don't persist in the killing area, which would otherwise increase the chances of evokers summoning vexes. The drops from the farm flow out of the chamber and are sent down this slow water stream so that stackable drops can group together before being sorted. The items impact against the bottom of the water stream, which aligns them so that they don't become trapped in the depression on top of the hoppers. Most of the items are also aligned along the side edge of the hoppers as well. A few extra drops will be left on the shifting floors, and the shifting action causes the items to jump around randomly and eventually work their way to the water streams. At the spawning platform, these extra drops are mostly saddles and totems. It's not really worth the effort to collect these, so they're just burned away with soul fire instead. The sorting system for the farm is pretty basic. Double speed sorters with overflow protection are used to pick up drops from the farm. Three of these sorters will pick up 82% of the emeralds, which sounds like a lot of loss, but the reality is that this will still provide you far, far more emeralds than you will ever need. Just a single sorter can be used to pick up over 97% of the redstone, and similarly, another sorter can be used for gunpowder. You can add additional sorters to grab anything else that you may want, like bottles or glowstone dust, and you can feed a hopper straight into an empty chest to grab a few totems if you like. Everything else is just burned away by fire. XP orbs are also dropped by the mobs, and the player is close enough to pick them up through the killing chamber floor. XP orbs stack together in 1.17 and above, so there's no need to destroy them. You need some of the XP while using the farm to keep your weapon in shape. The player serves as the clock for the farm. Swiping at the central armor stand causes an adjacent armor stand to jump up due to the sweeping edge enchantment on the sword. The jumping armor stand triggers a string and observer that sends out two pulses for each attack. One pulse for when the armor stand touches the string, and another when it leaves the string. The sticky piston toggles the position of an observer each time it gets a pulse, so that only a single pulse is sent out for each attack. This signal then goes to another sticky piston that toggles another observer. This one alternates between activating two opposing pistons that switch between soul sand and a magma block for the bubble column. This instantly changes the direction of the entire bubble column, and allows observers along the bubble column to detect the change. The signal is used to shift the floors over the killing chamber and in the spawning area, and it's also used to shift the raid center. Each of these villager stations has an extra observer compared to the one below it. Each observer adds a two game tick delay so that the raid center is progressively shifted upwards to the top of the tower. Okay, let's get to building. This farm must be built in a specific location within a chunk, and it must have a specific orientation. As a result, I'll be referring to the player's X and Z position within the chunk or subchunk frequently. 
You'll find this information to the left of the chunk coordinates on the F3 debug screen. These values range from 0 to 15 and are different from the usual coordinates that players normally reference. As an example, the X and Z subchunk position of my feet are currently 1 and 3. I'll still refer to the Y coordinates using the normal coordinate system, so my feet are at Y level 64 in this example. And I'll often need to refer to the Y level of certain blocks. The targeted block information on the right side of the screen shows you this information for the block that you're looking at. Start by finding a spot in the ocean at least 70 blocks away from any land. You can change the render distance to 6 chunks as a quick way to verify that there is no land nearby. You may find it useful to choose a build site that's close to a village so that you can grab a few of their villagers for the farm. But this isn't critical. You can move them through the nether as well. Set down a lily pad at the X and Z subchunk position of 14 and 9. Place a block underneath and crouch down to stack 6 scaffolding. At the top, your feet should be at Y69 and then bridge out to the south with one scaffolding to serve as a foothold later on. Continue stacking another 9 scaffolding until your feet are at Y78 and add another foothold to the south. Add 11 more scaffolding until your feet are at Y89 and add a foothold to the east. Add 12 more scaffolding until your feet are at Y101 and add a foothold to the south and also bridge out to the west on 5 scaffolding. Add 31 scaffolding to the tower, but don't go up yet. Place three soul sand blocks on each side of the bridge. Connect them in the middle with temporary blocks, and place another temporary block on top in the middle. Your feet should be at the X and Z subchunk position of 10 and 9, and at a Y level of 103 when standing on this top piece. Go back to the foothold, place a temporary block on the bridge next to the tower, and break the scaffolding bridge. From the temporary block, place lava on top of the mold for lava casting the drop chute. Continue up the scaffolding and confirm that your feet are at Y132 and add a foothold to the east. Add 31 scaffolding again so that your feet are at Y163 and a foothold to the west. Add another 31 scaffolding so that your feet are at Y194 and add another foothold to the west. Finally, add another 32 scaffolding so that your feet are at Y226. Bridge out on 5 scaffolding to the south and place a temporary block right in front of you and one at the end. When standing on this end block, your X and Z subchunk position should be 14 and 14, and the Y level of your feet should be 227. Go back to break the bridge, and place lava on top of the temporary block for lava casting the signal tower. Now quickly head down to the lava casting tower for the drop chute. Ideally, you want to get there before the lava from the signal tower reaches the same Y level. Stand on the temporary block and pick up the lava, and wait until you can just see the sides of the temporary block underneath, and then place water on top. Wait a moment and then pick up the water, and then clear out the cobblestone and temporary blocks so that the top of the tower is flush with the soul sand, and then work your way down to the cobblestone at the ocean surface. Make an entrance to the drop chute. Set down a torch inside and pillar up on six blocks in the middle, at the X and Z subchunk position of 10 and 9, until your feet are at Y69. Replace the block to the east at Y70 with a dispenser facing up, containing at least one armor stand, and remove the block over the dispenser and place a button to the left of it. Clear out the blocks three high to the west and north to make room for the sorting in storage system. I'll show a basic system in this tutorial, but you should feel free to make any changes that you like. Build out a 4x5 platform to the west, place a series of chests starting on the south wall and expand them into double chests, and then build out a series of double speed sorters with overflow protection to feed into these chests.
Add a hopper at the end to feed straight into a chest to grab any unsorted items. This chest tends to collect a lot of totems. Break these two cobblestone blocks and place glass blocks behind them, and then make the channel walls for the water stream over the hoppers, ending with a fire to destroy any items that you don't collect. On the other end, go up one level to place an open waterlogged trapdoor to start the water stream, and place another open trapdoor over it. Remove these four cobblestone blocks, place a glass floor in between, and form a too high channel for another water stream, but don't place the water for it yet. Instead, exit the channel and close it behind you. Make a 3x5 platform next to the water stream on the north side with your feet at Y73, and create an entrance to the player station inside. Open up a two block high area, add a flooring block with a button on top, Place a dispenser in the middle with armor stands inside, and a cauldron to the east of it with string on top. Surround yourself with seven glass blocks at eye level, and over the button, place a top slab overhead so that you would have to crouch down to get out. From the dispenser, crouch down and pillar up on two temporary blocks. Place signs over the water stream channel outside. Add water under the sign on the right so that the water flows left towards the two trapdoors, and then pillar up on two glass blocks, and then add water on the east sides of the killing chambers below, so that the water flows towards the stream outside. Pillar up on 24 solid blocks until you find yourself back at the top of the drop chute. Go back to the scaffolding and continue going up. At the top, stand on the temporary block and pick up the lava with a bucket. When you can just see the sides of the block underneath, place water on top, wait a few seconds, and then pick up the water again. Bridge to the tower with scaffolding, place two solid blocks on the northern corners of the tower at Y225, and place some distinctive blocks against these solid blocks for reference later on. For example, I use these red stained glass blocks. Climb up to the top and confirm that your feet are at Y227. Replace the temporary block in the middle with water, and build out a 7x7 platform centered on the water column, and secure the perimeter with walls and a single fence post to the south. Place a lightning rod in the northeast corner. Replace the four cobblestone blocks around the water column with glass blocks, and confirm that the red stained glass blocks are at the X and Z subchunk positions of 12 and 13, 13 and 12, 15 and 12, and 0 and 13. Once you've verified this, jump down to the ocean. Place slabs just under the water surface to form a dock for your villagers on the south side of the signal tower. Make steps and a short corridor to the tower with an overhead trapdoor at the end, and open up the tower and place signs to hold the water in. Go under the trapdoor to set down a composter. Place soul sand at the bottom of the water and plant kelp on it, and then either bone meal it until it doesn't grow anymore, or enter the water to stack kelp all the way up to the top. Put torches in your hotbar and repeatedly place them against the wall to catch a breath if you need it. When you're done, break the bottom kelp and confirm that the bubble column works by riding it all the way up to the top. Now work your way down the scaffolding to the foothold at Y194, and extend the scaffolding by a block, and turn left and extend it by four more. Carefully replace the cobblestone with an observer so that it looks into the water column. Now go up on more scaffolding and replace the cobblestone blocks over the observer with four additional observers, looking down. Place two sticky pistons facing up against the cobblestone over the last observer. On the right, place a composter directly on top of the sticky piston, and on the left, place the composter over the sticky piston with an air gap in between them. Add a glass block beneath you and confirm that your feet are at the X and Z subchunk position of 12 and 13, and a Y level of 201. Add a stair block on top of the composter on the right, and from here, surround yourself with a too high glass wall. Make sure that the space in this corner is empty so that a villager is clear to fall down to the next station below. 
Now waterlog the stairs before jumping down to the scaffolding bridge. Take a moment to look at the villager station because we're going to build similar ones below, but there are a couple of differences. Each station below has one fewer observer looking down than the one above it. This one has four observers looking down, so the next station below will have three, and so on. Another difference is that each station below will be offset just a little bit to the east compared to the one above it. As a result, the bottom observer for each station may look into the water column from a different direction. This one looks east into the water column. The next two stations below will have the bottom observer look south, and the lowest station will look west. Go down to the next foothold at Y163 and extend the foothold towards the tower. Here you'll make another villager station, with the bottom observer looking south into the water column, and there will be three observers looking down. The sticky pistons, again, are placed against the cobblestone over the top observer. Your feet should have the X and Z subchunk position at 13 and 12, with a Y level of 169 when standing inside the station. Now go to the next foothold at Y132 and do it all over again. The bottom observer looks south, there are two observers looking down, and your feet will be at 15 and 12 inside the station, with a Y level of 137. Again, make sure that this corner here is clear so that a villager can fall down to the station below. And finally, go to the foothold at Y89 to make the bottom villager station. The bottom observer looks west, and there is one observer looking down. Your feet will be at 0 and 13, with Y at 93. Bring a villager to the loading dock. The villager should be unemployed and not a nitwit, which has green sleeves. Break the boat and push the villager towards the tower. The villager will probably try to walk to the composter and get stuck at the trapdoor. Push it into the bubble column and follow it in. At the top, replace one of the red stained glass blocks with a composter and encourage the villager to jump in. When it's in place, aim carefully to break the composter so that the villager falls straight down. Repair the floor and repeat this process for each of the four villager stations below, using a different red stained glass block to drop each villager. A fifth villager is needed near the top of the farm. After you push the villager into the bubble column, break the composter and remove the soul sand at the bottom of the column, and place it back in. This activates the villager stations and deletes the water that the villagers are standing in. Now go up with your last villager and break the floor at the X and Z subchunk position of 13 and 15, and place a composter at Y level 224. When the villager goes in, place a glass block or bottom slab over its head. Now head down the scaffolding and make sure that all of the villagers are safely in place, and seal them in with glass blocks over their heads. At the foothold at Y101, bridge out to the signal tower and add an observer looking in and powering a solid block with a torch on top. Along the scaffolding bridge, bracket the structure with solid blocks as shown. Now add redstone dust on top of these blocks, setting a repeater for a two redstone tick delay for the signal on the north side. Place pistons on each side to shift floors, and remove the line of three cobblestone on the south side. Now build up two high glass walls, using the same figure eight pattern as the drop chute, and then build a third layer, with a lava-filled cauldron in the middle, composters to the east and west, and stair blocks to the north and south, with composters on each side of the stairs. Make sure that the smooth side of the stair block faces in, and place a glass block on the outside, and then waterlog the stairs. Now add another layer of glass blocks in the same figure eight pattern as before. 
leave a vertical gap of one block, and add a final layer of glass in the same figure eight shape. I've used red stained glass blocks to help make this a little easier to see, but you can use unstained glass. Your feet should be at Y107 when standing on top. Hop down to the redstone wiring and remove one glass and one cobblestone from the end of each soul sand line. Replace the cobblestone with soul sand, ignite it, and place a glass block on each side of the soul sand. Finally, place a bottom slab over each of the pistons to spawn proof. Now go down to the foothold at Y78, and just like before, bridge out to the signal tower and add an observer looking in, powering a solid block with a torch on top. Along the scaffolding bridge, bracket the structure with solid blocks for redstone wiring, setting a repeater for a two redstone tick delay for the signal on the north side. Clear out a too high section of the drop chute. Place pistons on each side to shift floors. Now replace the line of cobblestone on the north side with magma blocks, and then a line of soul sand, and replace the blocks again with magma blocks, and then a line of soul sand, and finally clear out the cobblestone on the south side. Use glass blocks to build up the channel for the water streams on the west side by two blocks. Place the glass at the end with a stair block, with the smooth side facing the magma block, and surround the stair block with glass blocks. On the other side, place a stair block with the smooth side facing the empty space in front of the pistons. Place a sign against the glass in the middle, remove the cobblestone on each side, now waterlog both stairs to form the water streams. Place glass blocks over the stairs and attach a trap door over the flowing water. Finish the water channel with three glass blocks on the other side of the trapdoors. Place glass blocks over the trapdoors and rebuild the rest of the drop chute walls that you removed earlier using glass blocks. You want glass blocks underneath any cobblestone or stone that you see overhead. Finally, spawn proof the pistons with slabs. Now go back down the scaffolding so that your feet are at Y72, and set an observer to look at the string at Y73. Against the observer, set a sticky piston facing down to push another observer looking west. Go to the foothold at Y69 and break all the scaffolding at and above Y70. Set another sticky piston against the last observer, facing down, and leave a gap to pull another observer looking north. Bridge out on the foothold at Y69 and set a solid block in the middle of the bridge with a repeater on top set to one redstone tick, and place a solid block between the observer and repeater. Jump up on that block and bridge out around the tower to the south side. Use a couple temporary blocks to set an ordinary piston facing the tower, and crouch down to set another piston in front of the repeater on the north side, again facing the tower. Go back and place a solid block at the end with a torch on top, and run redstone dust to the other side. Place a temporary lever to power the south piston, and remove the cobblestone in front of the piston on the other side. Place a sulcine block in front of the south piston, power it again, and again remove the cobblestone on the other side. Now remove the lever and set a magma block in front of the south piston. Hop down and break the rest of the scaffolding, and remove these two rows of blocks and also remove this one block at the villager dock. Light up the base to prevent spawning. Set ladders at the base to lead up to the platform in front of the player station. Remove the two temporary blocks at the player station, and press the button to dispense an armor stand there, and press the other button to dispense an armor stand into the cauldron. Place a stone pressure plate in front of the entrance and wire it with redstone dust to the sticky piston to the east. And finally, load the items into the sorters to configure them for collection.
To start the farm, you can approach by boat with the bad omen effect. The raid will start when you hop up to the base of the farm. Go up the ladder and head straight to the player station before the raid bar fills up 75% of the way. From here, look straight down into the armor stand and promptly start attacking every 30 game ticks, or 1,500 milliseconds. The ideal sword will have Sweeping Edge 3, Sharpness 5, Looting 3, and Mending. Diamond or Netherite swords, of course, are preferred, since the increased damage helps minimize the chances of a Vex being summoned. I've tested the farm for over 48 hours straight with such a diamond sword, and without seeing any Vexes. Weaker swords can still operate the farm, but it'll be a bit more dangerous. Be mindful of what you have in your inventory when AFKing at this farm if you think that there's a chance of dying to a Vex. To help mitigate the occasional Vex attack, build a beacon with strength and regeneration, and wear full diamond or netherite armor with protection 4 and thorns 3. If you want to AFK for long periods in hard difficulty, you'll need a beacon to prevent starvation. You won't be able to eat while looking at an armor stand, but if you don't have a beacon, you can instead AFK in normal difficulty, and the rates will decrease by about a third. When you're done with the farm, just stop attacking the armor stand, crouch down, and leave the player station. Make sure that there's no raid bar displayed. You can tap the pressure plate a second time if you need to, and then collect your loot and travel more than 128 blocks away. This will cause any mobs in the killing chamber to despawn, which will make the farm safe for you to start the next time that you want to use it. I hope this farm will serve you well, bringing you a lifetime supply of emeralds, tons of redstone and gunpowder, or whatever other raid drops that you may want. But before I go, I'd like to take a moment to thank my Discord community. So many members have tested the farm and provided feedback and corrections to both the farm design and the drafts of this video. In particular, I'd like to offer my gratitude to Hard, Scorpio, and Bread for everything that they've done. This has been my longest tutorial to date, and so I'd like to also thank you for sticking around this long. But even still, this video could have been even longer, since there's a lot of extra information that I can't reasonably fit into one video. Additional details are provided in the video description to help supplement this video, so please check it out, especially if you want to make sure that your build goes as smoothly as possible, since any corrections will be in there as well. Thanks for watching. Thank <laughs> you.